Good afternoon. Buon pomeriggio, good afternoon to everybody. We can, uh, we can start with this, uh, this uh, round table this afternoon. Thanks for uh, being, first of all, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm uh, Raul Caruso. I, uh, I do teach economics here in the Faculty of Economics and Social Sciences. I'm also the director of CHESPIC, which is the European Center for uh, Peace, Science, Integration and Cooperation. And uh, I'm pleased to, I'm pleased and delighted to, uh, to, to be here this afternoon because we are uh, focusing on a topic which is in the, in the very, in the, in the deep mission of this uh, university. It basically is uh, our second, our second event, which is uh, focused on uh, coexistence between religions and basically, and basically uh, how coexistence turns into, into policy making. Uh, before we start, I have to, I have to, I have to uh, excuse uh, the, on, on put the excuse on the behalf of the rector, uh, Magnificus uh, Professor Giardino, who is not here for a personal, uh, for some personal um, needs, and uh, we start, we start mm -hmm. immediately uh, by giving the floor to our the president of our foundation, our Lady of Good Council. Father Daniel Beltor. Thank you, Raul. Welcome to all and each one of you to this uh, meeting, to this uh, moment of uh, reflection. A welcome, a special welcome to His Excellency. I read uh, your uh, speech given yesterday, which uh, has connections with uh, the topic. Uh, of today, and uh, I welcome all uh, the people are here to reflect and to share with you because uh, I'm sorry to, I cannot be here because I'm preparing my trip uh, to a different country where I'm going only for vacation or for work. But I give thanks to Professor Gobber, to Dr. Claudio Paravati, to Professor, uh, Professor Atakan de Relioglu, to Dr. Georgios Gaitanos, and to uh, Professoressa Prof. Prof. Ina Merdianova for being here and to share with us. Um, and a short reflection. Raul, director of CESPIC, spoke about uh, this reality, which is the main organizer of this event. I inform you that Chespic was born on January 2016. It has been only three years old. Uh, because we wanted to give thanks and to appreciate the visit that Pope Francis did on September 21st, 2014 five years ago. He came here to meet all the religious leaders of Albania. And for us it was a gift that he decided to have this meeting in this university, not in this room, in the other one. And as a sign of appreciation, although he will not know, he will not, he will not know that we exist, we decided to create this center or scientific studies on peace. Why? Because we believe that a religion, every kind of religion, is not only a personal matter. If I am a believer, my being, my life is involved in what I believe. My identity is connected with what I believe into. 
and my actions must be connected as well. And each one of, of us has a way of believing and for this as a faith. Doesn't matter if I believe in this religion, in the other religion, but I believe in love. I believe in the value of spirituality. And I believe in my call to help the people and to be helped by them, to grow with them and to grow through them. I hope that uh, we can get, we can have several meetings of this kind so that uh, we can grow and we can uh, benefit this society and this world. Many times religion was an occasion of divisions and wars. Many times, too many times we can say, but it's not into the root of the religion, the war. Into the, in the root of religion, there is peace. And if we work together, we can truly create a better world and a better Albania. Thank you. Thanks, President Daniele Bertoldi. Now it's time to receive the address by His Excellency, Archbishop George Frendo. Thanks for coming, please. Thank you. Father Daniel has said that um, religion is not just a personal matter. It's not something that interests simply our personal lives, not at all. As a matter of fact, yeah, religion has necessarily a social dimension. Some uh, time ago, uh, following, uh, well, I wrote something about, precisely about uh, this social dimension of religion. Somebody replied that uh, I, am, I was interfering in politics, not at all. But precisely because we are convinced that the religion has a social dimension. Politics can change structures, but only religion can change hearts. And uh, the uh, item of this symposium shows also uh, that um, we are aware of the importance of uh, religion for society. When uh, Francis Fukuyama, the well-known uh, American journalist and sociologist, wrote his uh, very interesting book, uh, The End of History, following the uh, fall of communism in 1989, he was very optimistic and said that now with the fall of ideologies, the world will experience a period of... Uh, peace and uh, brotherhood. But uh, following the wars uh, in ex-Soviet republics and in, uh, in the Balkans, he uh, realized that he was too optimistic, that he was wrong, in fact. And uh, for this reason, in, a, um, in another book that he wrote later on, entitled Trust, he spoke about the need of uh, the, what he called the social virtues, the social virtues. And uh, precisely here we uh, uh, see, uh, we realize the importance of religion, of religions for society. Well, uh, I hope that this uh, symposium will uh, make us more aware of the importance and role of religions in our society. Thank you very much. Thanks to His Excellency, Monsignor Frendo. Uh, before we go ahead, let me, let me give me one minute to add something which is uh, uh, extremely important. Uh, this um, roundtable is organized by Chesapeake in cooperation with uh, uh, Baylor University and uh, Logos College uh, University. 
uh, which uh, are a university with, uh, with an identity, like ours. Okay? Uh, in this respect, I have to thank publicly uh, Professor Edmond Ederi, our vice rector, because he has been, uh, he has been um, feeding this cooperation in, in the latest years that uh, will be and that eventually contributed to organize. Uh, so uh, I also I'm also pleased to give my uh, hello to Brunilda Pascale, Ambassador Musai from the Presidency of the Republic of Albania. Thanks for coming. And uh, now, uh, just uh, another minute to to give you to give you what should be the flavor of this meeting. Uh, the idea behind this meeting is that. Uh, Coexistence between identities, that means coexistence between religion, is, is not just a fact, but is rather an artifact, in the sense that the humans do design and eventually do create and establish coexistence. So it's not something which is exogenous to, to our lives, it's not exogenous to policy making, it's not exogenous to the choices that uh, people, the ruling elite, ch take every, every day, okay? So it also means that uh, coexistence is also something which is subject to change when the themes are changing. And now we are on the age of uh, uh, subst substantial transformation. Albania is now a candidate country to the European Union, for example, which would be, would be, would be a very... Uh, an extremely significant step in the life of this society, uh, it, at the same time, would it, when it will be the only country in the European Union, or in, in any way in the, among the candidates, which has been experienced for uh, years, for centuries, uh, coexistence between different identities. There is no country in Europe like Albania in this respect. So, Organize this kind of roundtable it makes sense, especially for that, especially for the east of this country. And of course, in our university in Chesapeake, we are, uh, we are uh, drawing inspiration from that. Okay? So the idea, uh, the final idea of the meeting is that uh, since coexistence does change as the times are changing, that means that there must be some policies or policy making which takes into account coexistence between identities. And so basically when I invited our, uh, our speakers, uh, I, told you, I told them this. So basically, uh, let's analyze coexistence between religion across different perspectives, because they come from different fields. At the same time, in the end, let's, let's, let's try to give some suggestion for how to take into account this to, uh, for, uh, for policy making. That's it. And uh, now I introduce uh, our, uh, our speakers. And uh, starting from the left, uh, and uh, uh, taking, uh, uh, I have to say that I also have to excuse on behalf of uh, Claudio Paravati, who is uh, director of the Confronti Studi Study Center in Rome, which is uh, an organization of uh, the Valdesian community. Because he had a uh, uh, personal problem, so he couldn't come in the end. So from the left, uh, also in the, the same order of, uh, in the same order of uh, speaking, we have Professor Giovanni Gobber, who is the Dean of uh, Faculty of Foreign Languages at the uh, Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore in Italy. And uh, he is a, he's a professor in uh, linguistics. And uh, basically his perspective, his perspective is uh, drawn from... Uh, the, this interaction between uh, culture, religion, and uh, language contacts. Uh, eventually, we have Professor At Atakan Derelioglu. I'm sorry for my pronunciation, but uh, I think that I won't improve in the, uh, in the future, but I'll try, uh, who is from Bader University, and uh, who is, um, who is uh, from the Department of Islamic Studies at the department. You have, you have been the director of the department, right? Former, it is now kind of the former director of the Islamic. Uh, then we have Dr. Georgios Gaitans from uh, the Logos College University, uh, who is uh, now the head of the Department of the Social Theology and Religious Studies at the Logos University, and uh, Professor Ina Medjanova, uh, who is uh, 
who is uh, affiliated at the Institute of Econom Economics at the uh, Trinity College in Dublin, and also the Center for Trust, Peace, and Social Relations from Coventry uh, University. Uh, she has uh, studied uh, extensively the, 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 the Muslim communities within Balkans in, in, the, in the latest years, and uh, in, the, in, the, in the next weeks you also could, uh, will find uh, her books in our library if you are interested, okay? So, basically, I stop here uh, because I don't want to drain uh, any other time from my speakers, and then I give the floor to Professor uh, Gober. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you. I'd like to speak with... Okay. This is a, a short introduction. Oh, thank you. This, yeah, this one. Oh, my. Yeah? This. Oh, wonderful. So, uh, you can see my task is to introduce this, uh, uh, the, 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 this afternoon. And uh, I'm interested in linguistics, of course, in uh, uh, language contacts and in how words can. Uh, can reveal something about uh, uh, the history and the cultural history of communities. Uh, this is a, a particular uh, viewpoint on etymology. Well, uh, words, uh, I, I'm starting with, uh, I, I hope you can, can you read it? Maybe it's a, a bit, uh, I'd like to start with, uh, with a, a difficult word. It's, uh, categorization or conceptualization uh, because it's useful for our purposes yeah? and so first of all uh, what does categorization mean in uh, in linguistics we use this word uh, with this meaning uh, classifying reality by means of categories uh, we classify we look at the world and we try to classify to understand the world yeah? and uh, this word can be traced back to the Greek word category. It's a very important word uh, in Greek culture, in ancient Greek culture, in logic and philosophy, uh, but also in uh, cognitive linguistics. Is how we perceive and we uh, try to conceptualize the word. But the ancient Greek form, kategoria, uh, has to do with the, the meaning uh, way of being. Uh, a quality. Uh, the way of being is a, a feature, a characteristic of, uh, of an entity in the world, uh, animals, objects, uh, or persons. Uh, and there is a verb too, the verb categoreo or categoro. It's quite relevant because it has to do with uh, uh, to speak in public and to prove, to indicate something, and uh, the word is related with agora. Agora is the, the assembly, assembly, uh, the public space uh, where people uh, gather, to, uh, gather to together, they collect together, yeah? and uh, this word, this verb, and the family of these words uh, became then the meaning to say something about something else. Yeah? Uh, to affirm something. Uh, there is to find uh, a particular uh, interesting viewpoint on something in the world. And the fact is that we use language uh, to read the world, to, to look at the world, and we try to find the words, of course. But each word uh, has a long history, as you know, and in the roots of this word, of each word, something concerning the uh, original viewpoint on reality can be found. We need to analyze words by means of etymology, of documents, and then in, uh, we can see, we can understand something better about the culture of a given community and about the world. Because we can, uh, we can have, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, gather 
uh, uh, an understanding of the world. So, uh, this has to do with the word culture. What's a culture? You know, there are uh, nearly 50 different definitions of culture. Yeah? Uh, and what I use here is a viewpoint, uh, a definition of culture that is uh, particularly widespread among linguists and among anthropological linguists. Uh, one of the major studies and one of the most relevant linguists in the 20th century was uh, Edward Sapir. And Sapir was an American uh, German-born linguist yeah? and uh, he studied a lot of languages in Northern America. Yeah? And he found out that, of course, uh, languages and cultures are inter intertwined. Yeah? And what's a culture? He says, culture may be defined as what a society does and thinks. And language is a particular how of thought. It's a particular way to read the world. And so we can say that there, there are, uh, there's a, 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 an interrelation between world and language. And Sapir said that what we call the real world, or the facts outside, yeah, is to a large extent unconsciously built up on the language habits of the group. Uh, we are used to use a given language, and uh, this language offers us a given interpretation of the world. But what's uh, this interpretation? Well, it has to do with tradition. Hmm? Uh, what we, uh, we got from uh, the preceding generations, uh, how the, the experience of, of life was, uh, was seen, uh, how the world was experienced. Uh, and we have to, ha uh, to do with concrete people in concrete situations. And that's how uh, worlds have been established. Yeah? So there is a, a propension, a tendency to read the world in a certain way. Yeah? And these ways can be different. They can differ uh, from language to language. Yeah? So I'd like to... Uh, to show you uh, a couple of words that are quite interesting for our purposes, and we can see how uh, a categorization takes place, a conceptualization. But first of all, I'd like to distinguish two kinds of conceptualization or categorization. Yeah? Uh, the first is uh, what we are interested in, uh, in, in here now, uh, is the so-called motivation. Uh, when we, uh, we uh, express something, uh, we uh, build up uh, a, a viewpoint on this object in the world. Uh, if this viewpoint is transparent, uh, we use the term motivation. And motivation is the, a transparent way of denoting by means of words. Yeah. For example, this is a, a, a silly example, maybe, uh, but it's clear. Yeah? Uh, the expression uh, patkova in Russian Slavic, in the Slavic world, uh, world and in uh, English is horse shoes. Uh, they are shoes for horses, but they are not shoes. Uh, of course, in uh, patkova is not a shoe. Uh, it's a particular viewpoint on this object. Uh, in, uh, in German, my second language, so I, I'm translating from German into, into English now, <laughs> so it's Hoof-Eisen. Uh, Eisen is iron in English, and Hoof is what you have under the, the, the foot, the feet uh, of horses. In Italian you have Ferro, Eisen, di Cavallo, horse, a kind of uh, horse iron. Uh, so there are different ways to look at, at an object in the world. This is a, a quite concrete object. Yeah? We could try to do the same thing with a lot of words, and we can find different viewpoints on the same thing. Yeah? Uh, and this is the first, time, the first kind of categorization uh, we, are, we, are, we are considering uh, uh, in, uh, in the following 
uh, uh, slides. And another type, quite uh, more difficult, is the sem so-called semiotic relevance. You have semantic differences. What's a semantic difference? It's a, a difference in meaning. Yeah? Uh, a lot of differences in meaning yeah, are, uh, are gathered by means of semiotic differences. What's a semiotic difference is a difference of words. Yeah? You have different meanings and different words. It's very easy uh, to, uh, uh, to see uh, that there are different meanings because we use different words. Yeah? For example, uh, in English, you have a grandson and a nephew, uh, uh, ein Enkelkind und ein, ein, ein Neffe in German, uh, but in Italian you have only one word. Uh, a quite uh, well-known example is uh, the, uh, the, the, the difference in English between time and tense, uh, and time, tense, and weather. In, uh, in Germany, you have a similar uh, organization, uh, but just not the same, but you have Zeit und Tempus uh, of the eine Seite, uh, on the one side, and Wetter on the other side. Uh, in Italian, you don't distinguish between uh, time and weather. We have the same word. And we don't distinguish between time and tense. Uh, and people, pupils at school, uh, make a lot co of confusion when learning uh, foreign languages because they confuse time and towns. So, this is a categorization in general. Uh, let's, uh, but uh, I'd like to, to make a, 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 a step further. The fact is, languages and cultures uh, are not uh, so uh, separated from one another. Uh, they are interrelated. No language is without relationship to other languages. All languages and all cultures uh, in the world are interrelated. Uh, and so all identities have uh, something that is shared, and language shows this. Uh, uh, languages are rarely sufficient unto themselves uh, and uh, is sepia. When there's cultural borrowing, uh, there's always the likelihood that the associated words may be borrowed too. And we have loan words. Yeah? Loan words can be studied and analyzed, and a careful study of loan words constitutes an interesting commentary on the history of culture. The history of languages and the history of cultures uh, shows us that, that no language, no people, no community uh, is uh, separated from other languages, other peoples, other communities. And so there is a, a common ground uh, among these communities. It can be found in words. Uh, let's give a look to a couple of words, yeah. The word uh, bishop is interesting. Bishop, oh, a German, uh, no, German is uh, an English word, yeah. In German, Bischof, yeah, sehr gut. But uh, the origin is a Greek, Greek origin. Uh, we, have a, we have a very relevant uh, root, uh, is the root of uh, uh, skep skop skepsis, skeptic, skeptical. Yeah, the, uh, the original meaning was to, to look, to watch, to consider something, uh, to observe, to reflect. And we have a prefix uh, uh, meaning over, epi, and you can build uh, a verb, episcopeo, and then episcopos. What's an episcopos? Uh, is the keeper, hmm, the custodian, uh, who protects the community the community that has been gathered together. The community, it's quite interesting. Oh, episcopos can be found in, uh, or in Romance languages, in French, l'évêque. Uh, when you have this accent uh, circumflex, it means that you had an S, an ancient S has fallen down, and you write with a circumflex, l'évesque, uh, in Italian, vescovo. 
Hmm? But it's the same word. Yeah? In English, you had old English, biskop, and then bishop. In German, biskof, and then bischof. It's the same word. Yeah? So you see, it's a, a shared word, a piece of common ground in Europe, of course, in Western Europe, I would say. But another word, uh, the meaning better of church, is shared among the various languages in Europe, but we have a meaning and different viewpoints on this meaning, on this object. But what does, what's a church? Uh, we are used to think of a church as a, a kind of a, an institution. Hmm? Uh, but there is not only the institution, or as a building, where people gather together. But the original meaning is that of community. We have a verb, kalo, and para kalo, when you, 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 <laughs> you answer a phone call, yeah? call, kalo, uh, has a, a similar Indo European root. Uh, to call, uh, and kalo, I collect. Uh, I assemble people in a, in a place. Uh, and you can nominalize this verb, and you have ecclesia. Ecclesia is the assembly of people, is the community. People gather together. This, the, this is the very original meaning of church. Uh, the people uh, that are together in the name of God. Uh, and uh, uh, we have a, a very relevant word, of course, curios. Curios, curie, uh, curie eleison. Curios is the Lord. You can derive an adjective, curiacos. The feminine form is curiace, uh, and the meaning is of the Lord. And you can combine the two words together, and you have curiace ecclesia. Curiace ecclesia is the assembly of those who get together in the name of the Lord. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the church is a, a, a fact of a community, uh, a social event uh, of people. Yeah, the same. Yeah. And uh, so, Curiaque Ecclesia, uh, what's interesting from a, an etymological viewpoint and on the, on the, the, the a perspective of contact, on language contact, uh, has been translated. Uh, as a loan word, in ec as ecclesia, ecclesia domini. Domini is the genitive form of the Lord, yeah? and uh, you have uh, uh, the matrix uh, for uh, the formation of all the, the, the words that denote the church. Yeah? You have uh, Eglise, Ecclesia Eglise in the Romance languages, in uh, French, in Italian, and so on. And then you use Kyriake uh, for, uh, for the English church. Church is a loan word uh, from Greek through Latin. Yeah? And all other languages, Germanic languages like Dutch and German, have Kirk and Kirche. And Russian Tserkov, Pravoslavnaya Tserkov, is the Orthodox Church. Yeah? Uh, adding, I hope I have uh, still uh, two, five minutes. Oh, uh, enough, plenty of time. Yeah, very good. Uh, oh, excuse me, uh, the days of the week are irrelevant here. Yeah? Uh, another another uh, family of words uh, is connected, is related to Basilike, Basileus. Basileus is the king, uh, uh, a, a very important role in public life. Yeah? And you have, uh, can derive the, uh, the adjective Basilike. Basilike uh, was a palace uh, where public life, uh, the parliament, uh, uh, could be uh, the, the, the parliament could be hospital and basilica biserica in Romanian is the, the continuation eh? biserica in Romanian means church uh, if you translate this uh, viewpoint this interpretation as the, 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 a very relevant palace eh? uh, you have the a Latin word, domus. Uh, domus uh, is the 
the, the palace of the Dominus. Dominus is, is the inhabitant of Domus, a, a quite relevant and important personality in the community. And in, in Italian, you have Duomo, the dome. Duomo is the, the con, continuation of the Latin word Domus. But then you can find also in Slavic languages the trace uh, of the presence of the Catholic Church in, uh, in, Orient, in the Oriental space. The, the, Western space. the Western Church is the castellum, that is the castle, eh? because uh, a church was inside a fortress. Eh? and that uh, was built to protect the colonies from the other inhabitants of the space. And so this uh, tells us that the Catholic churches in Russia were the churches uh, for people coming from the West. And you have the Polish word kościu. Kościu comes from uh, castello. Kościu means church. And Castiol, Castiol in Russian, has the same meaning. So Russian has two words, uh, Tserkov uh, for churches, uh, for Russian churches. Uh, Castiol uh, for churches uh, for people other than Russians. Uh, so all this uh, is, in my opinion, very relevant and interesting because if you take into account how a word has been built and we develop a historical an analysis of the lexical root of this word, then a viewpoint on how the denoted reality was experienced can be discovered. What's, what is interesting here are the different viewpoints, uh, the different readings, but a common ground can be found by comparing all the human experiences uh, and uh, we can see that uh, interpersonal relations uh, among peoples of a community are relevant. Uh, and so this is, in, uh, I think, quite uh, relevant because church was originally a community of people sharing a common ground. Uh, and bishops were those personalities who protected the community and helped people to understand their common experience. So, uh, understanding a commonality of experience means trying to train and uh, work, you know, course, uh, uh, doing all efforts to find a common ground, uh, to find out what we share, uh, uh, what is shared, uh, the shared experience, not the differences, uh, but uh, similarities uh, are often uh, so obvious, uh, we, uh, we pay attention to differences more than to similarities. Huh? Uh, a historical and uh, etymological analysis of this kind uh, can, show, can tell us that uh, there is a similarity that has to be rediscovered. Yeah, so, thank you. Now it's time to, to go ahead and then we have Professor Atakan from the Department of Islamic Studies at Bede University. And uh, his speech is about the Islamic foundation of religious pluralism and uh, framework in the framework of democracy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this <clears throat> beautiful organization, uh, Our Lady of Good Counsel, and the guests, lecturers, students, I hope this is going to be a fruitful session gathering for all of us. We are sharing. Sharing is something very important in this digital age. So my topic is about religious pluralism within the framework of democracy and um, identity maintenance. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the term religious pluralism. It's a controversial term. It's very difficult to define this term in a way which is acceptable to everyone. I'll try to give you some related terms like exclusivism, inclusivism, relativism, and then I'll focus on 
pluralism, religious pluralism, and I'll give you two definitions, and I will prefer one over the other. And then I'll try to support that idea based on the scripture, Quran, and the prophetic tra tradition, Sunnah. And then I will be focusing on democracy and privacy. I'll try to establish a kind of connection, and then I'll try to come to a conclusion. First, you know, um, one could perceive all religions as relative. Thus, affirm that religion can, uh, no religion can claim to have the absolute truth. We call this relativism. So there are terms like relativism, subjectivism. There are some similarities between these two terms. So subjectivism is um, the truth of a moral claim is determined by the beliefs of the individual. So di different people can have different truth claims. On the other hand, relativism, the truth of a moral claim is determined by the belief of the culture. So the truth can vary from one culture to another. And then one could perceive that the religion he or she is following is the only exclusive path leading to the truth. This is called exclusivism. The others are damned. This is the path. If you come, you will be saved. So there is another term on the other side, inclusivism. And inclusivism has two aspects, traditional inclusivism and relativistic inclusivism. Traditional inclusivism tells us one believes that he or she has the absolute truth and the others are correct in so far as they agree with him or her. And relativistic inclusivism asserts that there is an unknown set of truths which represent the absolute truth and no one has yet reached that absolute truth but everyone is reaching to one or another degree uh, to that absolute truth. So this is inclusivism. And now pluralism, religious pluralism. Once religion is not the only way the exclusive way that leads to truth. And thus the acknowledgement that at least some truth or true values might exist in other religions, which is more likely in conformity with Islamic understanding. And I'll try to focus on this, but before focusing on this definition, I'll give you one more definition, perennialism. <laughs> Sorry. Perennialism is an educational philosophy, and, but uh, some people use, some scholars use this uh, concept as a definition of religious pluralism. So they say all religions converge on a single universal truth. So the exclusive truth claims of different religions after taking a long and hard examination, turn out to be the uh, variations of universal truths that have been taught since time, on, time immemorial. Okay, now, the, the previous definition. My path is not the exclusive path leading to the truth, and some true values exist in other religions. So this is more likely in conformity with Islamic understanding. Now I'm going to try to support that idea from uh, Quran, some verses and prophetic traditions. First, salvation. <coughs> salvation is a main issue. Who is going to be saved? Who is going to go to heaven? Am I right? This is a very serious issue. So if we look at the Quran... Chapter 2, verse number 62, talks about that. It says, those who believe, believe in one God. 
those who call themselves, who declare themselves Christians, those who declare themselves Jews, those who are Sabians. It starts with that. So, by the way, you know, Muslims do not call Christians as infidels or non-believers. The Quranic concept for Christians is the people of the book, Ahl al-Kitab. Because they have been given a revelation and Quran confirms that. The, the divine authorship of the revelation given to Jesus, Moses, and so forth. So, these are the groups and God says, whoever believes in God and in the hereafter and the good works, they will have their rewards with their Lord. They will have no fear, nor will they grieve. So see, this is written in the Quran, but not uh, on Muslims, maybe. So, which means there are Two key, uh, three key concepts, and I, I'm going to add one more in this verse. Belief in the oneness of God, I I belief in the hereafter, and doing good works. So this is the path to salvation. But I'm adding belief in the prophets because this is a teaching which was brought to human beings by the prophets. Okay, the second point. Who will be saved and how will be saved? Once Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by the way, when we uh, mention the names of the prophets, we say peace be upon him, like sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a sign of respect, Jesus peace be upon him, Moses peace be upon him. Um, so when he was talking about who will be saved in the presence of his companions, and he said, Len yunajjiya, the deed of any one of you will not save you from hellfire. They were surprised. What, what we do is not going to help us in the hereafter. And then they said, Oh Prophet, even you will not be saved? He said, Wala ana. I will not be saved by my deeds. The Prophet the carrier of the message. And then he added, unless and until my Lord bestows his mercy upon me, I will not be saved. The salvation is totally dependent on God's mercy and compassion. What does this tell us? No one has authority over himself and the others for salvation. No one can interfere okay thank you so okay the theologic theological correctness who is right who is wrong what are we gonna do so Quran confirms the divine authorship of the previous scriptures there are so many verses in the Quran chapter 5 verse number 48 which says وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ O Muhammad, peace be upon him. We send down this book to you, confirming what came before. Bible, the Torah, the Tanakh, the Zabur, Psalms of David. These are the names mentioned in the Quran. So all the time, these previous scriptures are, you know, uh, reminded. So then Quran confirms the divine authorship of previous scriptures. Okay, is it, right, is it right to read the Bible as a Muslim? Is it right to read the Torah? Once, you know, when he was in Medina, Prophet migrate, migrated from Mecca to Medina because of the oppression. There were 45% of the population was Jew in Medina. Imagine, he established a constitution and there were Jews who were trying to convert Muslims to Judaism. They were reading the Torah in Hebrew and then translating that uh, passage to Arabic and trying to convert them. They came to prophets. Abu Huraira, for example. Oh, prophets, Jews are trying to convert us. What are we going to do? 
They are reading from the Torah. Is it right to read the Torah? Is it right to read the Bible? Prophet said, Hadithu an bani Israel, wala haraj. Relate from the children of Israel. No harm. There is no harm. Look, if you look at the commentaries of the Quran, hundreds of commentaries of the Quran, you will see narrations from the Tanakh, from the Bible. What is called as Israeliyet. This happened. But today, so we need to gather together. We need to have such, you know, uh, collaborations a lot to break, you know, those barriers between us. The Prophet achieved that. And once another companion came to the Prophet, Oh, Prophet, they are putting pressure. What are we going to do? They want us to be a Jew. What do you offer us to say? He said, uh, this is a verse from the Quran. Okay, do not enter into quarrel with them. Say to them, we believe in what was revealed to us. We believe in what was revealed to you. This is a verse from the Quran. Ilahuna ilahukum wahid. Your God, our God, the same. Nahnu lahu muslimun. Muslim means we submit ourselves that particular God. So this was the prophetic advice to them. Okay, Quran indicates that common points should be given priority in that dialogue. You know, um, for example, chapter 3, verse number 64 says, O oh, people of the book, come to a common term. Let's confirm that there is one God. And let's submit ourselves to that God. So let's gather together on the base of monotheism. And as you see, human societies are different, diverse, people are different. And uh, you, for example, UNESCO's cultural diversity, Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity, which says cultural diversity is as necessary for humankind as biodiversity is for nature. So then what does the Quran say about diversity? Quran allows for diversity and recognizes that this will remain the case. There are two verses in the Quran. One, uh, chapter 10, verse number 99, which says, it's addressing the Prophet, which says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَآمَنَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضُ كُلُّهُمْ جَمِيعًا O Prophet, if your Lord had willed so, all who are on earth would have believed which means this was not the intention of God, being in the same religion, being in the same path. Thank you. So, and then says, O oh, Prophet, would you then force people until they all become believers? Even Prophet himself was not allowed to put pressure on people to become believers. Can you imagine? Okay. Is this something peculiar to him or to that time or to all the times? Chapter 11, verse number 118, which says, If your Lord had will so, he would have made you one nation, following one religion, one way of life. They, the entire humanity, will never cease to defer, to disagree. This is our nature. Okay, um, if we have such nature, okay, coercion in faith, this is a problem. Everybody wants, you know, to accumulate more supporters. So, if you look at the Quran, Quran explicitly, categorically, decisively prohibits coercion in faith which violate a fundamental human rights. If you look at the Quran, for example, chapter 2, verse number 256, La din. Actually, so many things to mention, but we have time limit. No compulsion in religion. You know, this was about the children of uh, people of Medina. 
they were idol worshippers, their children were becoming Jews. When Islam came, they wanted to put pressure on them to become Muslims. And they came to the Prophet, are we allowed to put pressure on our kids? Our kids. Chapter 2, verse number 256 said, La ikraha No compulsion, coercion in religion. They were not allowed. And they, their children uh, remained as Jews. Chapter 16, verse number 28, describes freedom of faith as will to believe, will to disbelieve, which says, The truth from your Lord has arrived. Whoever wills to believe, let him believe. Whoever wills to disbelieve, let him disbelieve. So see, freedom of belief from the Quran. Okay, I'm gonna... Um, if you look at the prophetic tradition, there are so many traditions which lays the foundation of a plural society. He said, all people are as equal as the teeth of a comb. Okay? And uh, Islam refrains from discrimination based on race, color, age, nationality, or physical traits. Once he said, you all are from children of Adam, and God created Adam from the dust of the earth as is written in the Bible and the Torah. So you have the same root. And uh, this is the basis for a plural society. Okay, compatibility of democracy with Islam, privacy, there are so many issues. Uh, if you look at the title of my presentation, and I, I think I will not be able to cover all of them, but I'm gonna focus on something very serious. This is, I think, something common for Muslims, Christians, and Jews. So the term sovereignty and authority. In the past, like 20 years, 30 years ago, when the democracy came to the stage, people, I mean, faithful believers were a bit, you know, shocked. They, they used, for example, in Turkey, I'm from Turkey, they used to say sovereignty and authority without any reservation and condition, belong to the nation. Oh my God, this is against religion. Sovereignty belongs to God, not to the nation. But look, there is very, um, you know, subtle point in here. Sovereignty and authority, without any condition and reservation, belongs to the nation, doesn't mean that it is... Uh, taken from God and given to the nation. It means that the authorization granted to people by God is relieved of an individual, an oppressor, a, a monarch, an oligarch, a theocrat to be entrusted to people. For example, in Turkey now, uh, there are unfortunate things happening in that respect. You know, we, democracy is not just labeling by labeling. So sovereignty and authority given to people means that no one has a powerful position to make the decisions for the country. It's not between the lips of a one particular person. Okay, I will just move and... Conclusion. I'm going to read the conclusion. Not the, uh, there were so many issues. So at least the conclusion is going to give you an idea. We cannot secure the world for democracy unless we also secure the world for diversity. Cultural diversity is as necessary for humankind as biodiversity is for nature, as stated in uh, UNESCO's Universal Declaration of uh, Cultural Diversity. The cultural diversity seems to be possible only through the plurality of ethnicities, cultures, languages, religions, and lifestyles. Privacy is not being alone, but being let alone unless by this one infringes on the freedoms and rights of others, on public order or morals. In digital age, the scope of the neighborliness is almost inclusive of the entire humanity. The Muslim attitude or the Islamic attitude toward neighbors includes wishing for their neighbors what they wish for themselves. It includes the sharing of happiness and sorrow. It prohibits 
spying on them, gossiping about them, harming them in any way. Instead, it establishes respect for their privacy. Protecting privacy enables preservation of identity and its maintenance, which safeguards pluralistic nature of a society and democracy. Thank you for your patience. Gaetanos from uh, Logos University, the role of religious communities in the public political sphere and uh, historical uh, reflection and modern perspectives. Thank you. I'm really glad to be in part of this uh, round table and thank you for the invitation. So, the issue of the relationship of religious communities or institutions is now being approached based on the political and social perceptions as they have been saved in the modern world. In particular, the issue of human rights, but especially the demand for religious freedom, is what played the key role in shaping the new perceptions of the relations of the state with the religious communities. Of course, we must bear in mind that in order to establish these relations, we must always take into account the political, social, and economic conditions at local and international level. Clearly, such a matter is the continuing movement of populations, which alter the composition of societies and set a new variable in approaching this issue. At the same time, the various religious institutions seek to establish and strengthen their position in the society in which they operate and seek to maintain close relations with the state, especially in cases where they seem to retain the majority within the population. An interesting example is the case of Hinduism, as where it is in modern form, voices developed that push the state to recognize Hinduism as the official national religion of India. It is clear that such a pursuit can cause tensions among religious groups, as the strong religious group may put pressure on minorities and devalue them, concerning their rights to the law. Thus, there is often the phenomenon where religious communities with an apparent majority demand legal protection from the state, although they should not have chosen this strategy, because theoretically the majority of them are in guarantee of security. On the other hand, when a religious community is considered a minority, it invokes the application of human rights. For these reasons, those religious groups who are numerically major should have greater tolerance and understanding of the rights of religious minorities, since in a similar position may be people of the same religion that live in other societies where they do not enjoy the numerical majority. However, fanatism and absolutism are a common approach to the issues of religious institutions. In any case, it is of particular interest to see how the relations between the state and the religious communities have historically formed in order to better understand how the perception of this relationship have been established and saved in the modern world. It is characteristic that in the traditional societies there was a normal connection of the state with the religion whether it had a special place in the administration and the structure or was used for the ideological legitimacy of the state by religion. But in the modern world, many things have changed and diversified this mentality, leading to a redefinition of relations between the state and the religious communities. Of course, we must be careful not to confuse the issue of relations between the state and the religious communities and that between religion and politics. In the modern world, it is different how a religious group faces political power and whether religious belief can influence the political attitude of what the state's relations with the religious group will be and in, and in which legislative framework they are established. Regarding the issue of the relationship between religion and politics in modern times, we find that politics has been completely separated from religion since it is not understood by religion and is not legitimized by religious leaders. Regarding the issue of the state's relations with the communities, it is known that various systems have, have been established that have passed through various phases until they are consolidated. For this reason, it is useful to see how these perceptions have historically been drawn by stressing that the state's relations with religious institutions now depend on the framework defined by the Declaration 
of human rights and religious freedom and not on the desires and demands of religious institutions, especially those who are in a majority position in a local society. Therefore, the relations of the state with the religious community depend on the way the state faces the citizens and the religious groups in its territory. We will therefore briefly try to examine how the relationship of the state with the religious institutions and the church, in particular, evolved historically, which can help to see how the perceptions have been shaped on this issue. During the first Christian centuries, there was no clear attitude or arrangement for the relations of the state with the church. The position of Christ is characteristic. Then give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's which clearly distinguishes the religious institution from the state. Christ's demystifying attitude to Roman authority and the negative perception of it by Christians led to their persecution by the Roman authority. This situation was completed by the Edict of Milan, 313, which was issued by Licinius and Constantine the Great, and religious freedom was first established and allowed Christians to publicly and freely perform their worship. Later, in 321, Christianity was recognized as the only religion of the state by Emperor Theodosius the Great. Subsequently, in Byzantium, the church was essentially submissive to the state, with the emperor having the final say in many critical decisions of the ecumenical synod concerning doctrine, many of which were state laws. The emperor decided to elect bishops and patriarchs despite any reactions from ecclesiastical factors. The bottom line is that the Byzantine state dealt with political power in a theocratic way and the whole administration of the church followed changes in political affairs. Generally, the church in the East never exercised political command. On the contrary, in the West, it has gradually begun to emphasize the primacy of the Church of Rome in the Christian world, leading to the construction of teachings with theological clock in order to support Pope's supremacy, not only within the church, but also at the political level. The Pope became the head of state since 754, bringing political and ecclesiastical power to his authority. Since then, the Church of Rome had begun to present Christian teachings in theoretical terms and sought to exercise political power by invading the affairs of the great nation states. Thus, an understanding of subjugation of secular to spiritual power and the service of the interests of the second from the former was established. This situation has provoked the action of national states and the decline of the authority of the Pope, which has contributed to the development of new religious movements that have shaped the modern world as the Reformation. During the Reformation, new independent Christian communities emerged, which claimed to represent the one and original church. There was a rapture in the West, and it was established the principle, cuius regio eus religio, which offered the possibility to the citizens either to remain faithful to the Roman Catholic Church or to establish reformed churches in their states or refuse to identify themselves with some of the non-Christian confessions. The above principle, which said that the citizens had to follow the rulers' faith, began to cause problems in terms of the rulers' interference resulting in religious wars in the 16th and 17th centuries. From the 18th century, began to develop views on the separation of the state from the church and philosophical views that gave birth to ideas of tolerance. Modern political move developments gave birth to the ideas of human rights and tolerance of the other, even in states that had expressed some confessional preference. But it is interesting to see how this relationship was understood and developed in other countries, such as Eastern Europe and the United States. In particular, in Russia, after the establishment of the Patriarchate in 1593, the Russian Patriarch was the second person in the hierarchy under the Tsar. In 1652, Patriarch Nikon wanted to impose the recognized as the first person. This situation brought the invasion of Peter the Great, who in 1721 brought reforms and determined the Church to be governed by a permanent session, and for all its decisions, it would, be, would need the consent of the Imperial Commissioner. Church administration and church and state relations were based on the Protestant model, which was adapted in the case of Russia. The church's attempt to regain its old privileges was halted by the establishment of the status of socialism, following an anti-religious policy 
abolishing all privileges of the church and confiscating ecclesiastical property. After World War II, the situation gradually improved. Until religious propaganda was abolished and many temples were returned. At the time of the perestroika, many freedoms were recognized in the church and the new law on religions has been enforced since the 90s. There is no official religion in the US and all religious communities are considered private associations that are maintained by their own means. They are recognized by the country on the basis of the voluntary participation of their members and their rights are protected by the USA. Of course, the rights and freedoms of religious communities are determined by laws that differ from state to state, but there is generally the notion that human rights are human freedoms, which the U.S. has to protect. There are different systems in the European Union that define the state's relations with religious communities, and this depends on the diversity of cultures and nations. Clearly, all of these systems are based on Christianity despite their different origins, and we must not forget the existence of other religious communities, such as Islam and Judaism, that have had and have a significant presence in various European countries. There are currently three systems of state and church relations. The first system is characterized by the existence of a state church, where there are connections between the state and the church, despite the differences from country to country. The second system is dominated by the complete separation between the state and the church, while in the third system there is a basic separation between the state and the church, which means that some common goals and activities are recognized between the two institutions. In any case, the change in social conditions and the emergence of new religious communities leads to the search for new solutions to the relations of the state with these communities, especially in the case of the countries in the state church system where it seeks a way of releasing the state from the church. In all countries of the European Union, the right to freedom of religion is recognized, which allows other religious communities to exist and function and citizens to freely determine their faith. In the legal framework, the European Union integrates them with NGOs, although they react and seek to belong to a particular category of religious associations, so they are neither public nor private. Before we look at the modern perspective and the possibilities that exist for the relationship between the religious institutions and the state, we must comment on some basic points from the above brief historical review. Whenever a religious community sought to impose its position on society and the public political sphere, its role was strongly challenged. The examples of the Roman Catholic Church and the Russian Church, which eventually led to the Reformation and the Churches of Reformation, and Russia's intervention and reform of the church by the state are known. On the other hand, this situation was not observed in the East because the church was subjected to the state. But from the Ottoman era and then, the framework for the acquisition of political responsibilities was favored. However, this development in this field of the offered church later led to the development of secularization in Greece and elsewhere and the formation of anti-literary tendencies. It is characteristic that when there is a pursuit from the ecclesiastical space to conquer other fields of public life, then it is caused in the long run a reaction and conflict from society. So we ended up in the modern age to create a framework that leads to the separation of the state from the religious communities and institutions. If this separation is not achieved, then it is necessary to clearly define the position of the religious institutions and to emphasize they should not interfere with political issues. I will conclude this lecture by referring to the reasons for this separation. The first reason is the freedom of man in the cautious choice of religion. Religion cannot be imposed by the state and is a personal choice. The concepts of democracy and human rights lead to the issue of the relations of the state with the religious institutions. The religious institution which is totally connected to the state and calls for its imposition on the people from the state then ignores the people and does not wish to come in contact with them. The second reason is that the state's relations with the religious community should be based on religious freedom. The state should treat its citizens equally, irrespective of religion. This means that it must treat all religious communities in the same way, regardless of the majority and minority. But if there is no equal treatment, then a discriminative situation is established. 
That is why we point out that human rights issues should not be subject to majority and enforcement procedures. In essence, detaching the state from a particular religion will give the powerful religious majority the opportunity to communicate frankly with society about the crucial and modern problems that concern it and to work with the state on various issues on an agreed basis. Also, the association and close relationship of a religious community with the state does not allow the renewal and improvement of religious communities legislation and it also causes a problem for the powerful religious community as it does not help it to develop and adapt to modern circumstances. When religious communities are treated equally by the state, this does not mean that the religion or religious tradition of a place is being persecuted. But on the contrary, the religious freedom of all citizens is guaranteed and safeguarded. Besides the purposes of the state is to treat citizens as citizens and not as believers of one or other's religious tradition. The third and final reason is that the close relationship of a religious community with the state essentially hinders the work of the community itself. Close relationship and security with the state is in fact an obstacle to open a sincere dialogue with the society and having the state as its cover usually responds to the demands of a society in an aggressive manner. On the other hand, the lack of serious dialogue leads in many cases to sending more requests for legal protection and safeguard. However, this attitude cancel out the spiritual role and the real reformation that can succeed in society. Finally, usually the churches in the European area should be relieved of the sick perception of the past, which also gives an ideological interpretation of history. The acquaintance from, from this perception and dependency in many cases from the state may trigger the positive presence of religious communities in the modern world. Thank you for listening. We go to the, the, the last talk by Professor Ina Merjanova. Uh, I repeat from the Irish uh, School of Ecumenics of the Trinity College in Dublin and also affiliated at the Center for Trust, Peace and Social Relations, University of Coventry. Her, uh, her talk is titled Religion, Conflict, Peace Building in the Balkans. Uh, hello, everybody. I am um, a sociologist of religion and not theologian, uh, which means that I am interested not only in what different religious traditions uh, uh, say and think uh, about uh, the relations between uh, the divine and, and, and the humanity and uh, uh, what different people uh, believe, but I'm also interested in what people do with their beliefs. Uh, my topic today is um, religion, conflict and peace building in the Balkans. Uh, the Balkans is a place uh, where four major religious traditions uh, Eastern Christianity, Catholicism, Judaism, and Islam have coexisted and interacted for centuries, uh, particularly uh, from the late uh, 14th century onwards with the expansion uh, of the Ottoman Empire and the conquering of the peninsula by uh, the Ottomans, uh, Islam spread in this part of the world and became uh, an important religious tradition that uh, shaped uh, further uh, historical experiences. Uh, I am um, saying this because many of the processes that we uh, experience and observe today in the Balkans are related to uh, historical processes, uh, especially uh, during the uh, Ottoman Empire. Under the Ottomans, uh, religion uh, was a major uh, characteristic uh, of uh, division between the different communities. In other words, in this vast empire, uh, multicultural and uh, multi-religious, different religious and, and ethnic groups were ruled, managed and administered, not according to um, ethnicity, language, race or uh, territory or other uh, characteristics, but they were managed and ruled according to their religious affiliation. Uh, people uh, in this vast empire were uh, structured according uh, to uh, their affiliation with the so-called millets. This, this is uh, a system of social administration uh, called millet system. Uh, and this 
connection, this strong uh, preeminence of religious affiliation uh, became an important characteristic that later uh, played out in, in the nation building processes in almost all uh, populations in the Balkans. In other words, religion and uh, ethnic identity were closely intertwined uh, starting from, uh, from experiences and systems of administration under the Ottoman. Uh, after the Second World War, oh, sorry, um, with the breakup of uh, the Ottoman Empire and the establishment of the different uh, modern uh, nation states, religion became powerfully involved in, uh, in these national ideologies everywhere, perhaps only with the exception of Albania. Uh, so religious, again, and national identities uh, became uh, closely intertwined, and this meant that religious difference, religious pluralism, was looked upon with suspicion by uh, uh, ethno-political uh, elites in the region, and there have been many attempts to manage this religious pluralism by the nation states, uh, not uh, only by peaceful means, but by uh, expulsion and even by extermination and ethnic cleansing. Um, after the Second World War, uh, the region became, um, the, all the countries in the region except for Greece, became part of the Eastern uh, sphere of uh, the Soviet sphere of influence and religion, this meant for religion, suppression, marginalization and extermination in some extreme cases as was the case in Albania where we, we know that religion was uh, uh, completely, um, completely effaced from, from the public sphere and uh, the, the state was uh, proclaimed atheistic by constitution. Uh, and the simu in similar degree this happened in other countries, also in Bulgaria uh, where I'm uh, originally from, uh, religion was persecuted and marginalized, uh, but uh, uh, this did not mean uh, complete extermination and with the development of new nationalisms, especially with the weakening of the communist states and uh, uh, the advent of democracy, uh, again, nationalism and religion became uh, closely uh, interlinked and uh, this is why uh, religion uh, became uh, so prominent in, in the public sphere, not just because people suddenly rediscovered their religious uh, backgrounds and uh, uh, their, spiritual, uh, their spiritual links, but also because uh, religion became a powerful boundary maker for communities and also uh, religion became powerfully involved in politics through these uh, nationalist ideologies and practices that developed. This was particularly evident in the case of uh, Yugoslav Federation where the transition from uh, communist um, parties, one party state to multicultural, uh, sorry, multi-party and multi-party uh, multi system was not uh, peaceful like uh, in other countries in Eastern Europe, but it uh, uh, took a high toll by uh, conflict and, and violence. Uh, why was interreligious dialogue such an important strategy for building peaceful societies uh, after the violent breakup of the Yugoslav Federation and the several wars? And, and so, uh, just to remind you, 1991-92, um, uh, the war between for the Serbian, uh, between Serbia and Croatia after the Croatian secession, 92-95, the war in Bosnia, um, with the, uh, uh, when Bosnia proclaimed independence uh, from, from the Federation, 97-98, the Kosovo War, uh, 99, uh, conflict near war situation in Macedonia. So these multiple conflicts everywhere in, 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 in the former Yugoslavia uh, were uh, not religious conflicts and, and the, the wars in Yugoslavia were not religious wars, but because religion was uh, powerfully involved in, in the shaping of nationalist ideologies, uh, and supplied uh, symbolists, uh, uh, symbols, mythologies, and uh, also emotional attachment. Uh, religion was very prominent. Uh, we all remember that religious <laughs> clergy went uh, and blessed uh, uh, armies going into battle. 
um, we remember how many religious buildings were destroyed during the war. They were targeted and destroyed uh, because they were markers of identity and presence and historical presence of, of a different population. Uh, because of this uh, real or perceived role of religion in the conflict, after already during the conflicts and especially after the end of the conflicts, uh, interreligious dialogue for peace building became major methodology to promote reconciliation and peaceful societies in the Balkans. Many international organizations arrived to the region. Uh, also many uh, local uh, NGOs were established uh, to uh, promote reconciliation and, and better coexistence in the pluralist societies. Uh, several interreligious councils were established, including one in Albania, where uh, representatives of the major religions uh, uh, come together uh, regularly and discuss and try to resolve uh, important issues uh, of, uh, uh, of the day. Um, during, um, so between 2005 and 2008, uh, I, um, I had an extensive uh, research project which was, uh, uh, which was uh, focused on uh, interreligious dialogue for peace building in the Balkans together with a, a colleague of mine from, from uh, University of Montreal, uh, Professor Patrice Brodeur. So we uh, interviewed uh, many uh, religious activists, religious leaders, including Monsignor um, uh, George uh, uh, Frendo and uh, uh, also Archbishop Anastasius in this country, uh, but also in other, in other countries in the Balkans. We tried to see uh, to what extent these uh, efforts to promote uh, peace uh, through interreligious dialogue have been successful or what we called uh, to what uh, extent they uh, have been uh, sustainable and pr have produced some uh, real change in the minds and hearts of the people and to what extent they have been challenged by, uh, by realities in, uh, in the ground. Uh, our, our findings can very broadly be summarized under the following. Uh, so achievements uh, were uh, a growing uh, understanding of people from different uh, religious traditions that uh, there is no alternative to uh, dialogue and to peace as one of, uh, in, of our uh, interviews in Bosnia uh, put it and many other interviews also uh, supported this view. So people have uh, come to understand that uh, divisions and conflict and tension uh, bring uh, violence, bring uh, uh, social uh, breakup, and uh, so they have to work. They they have to promote reconciliation and try to keep society uh, in peace. Um, another achievement uh, was uh, a very good. Uh, uh, participation and strong participation, I would say, of women in different religious organizations, even though this was not uh, like a systematic approach of international organizations to promote better participation of women. Local women, and especially we found this uh, through uh, over a dozen interreligious uh, seminars and workshops we, uh, we did in different uh, places in the box. Our female participants were very active and very outspoken uh, when, uh, when it came to how to address grievances and uh, how to uh, uh, achieve better coexistence. Um, another good achievement uh, was the um, development of good educational programs and training programs uh, and also publishing programs where many books uh, from uh, uh, other international authors have been translated in local languages. Many um, multi-religious calendars have been produced every year for, for people to know in, in multi-religious societies, to know and understand uh, what their neighbors celebrate uh, in, in the different uh, times of the year. Uh, especially um, good achievement was, for example, uh, a multi-religious choir Pontanima in, uh, in Bosnia, which was uh, started by a Franciscan monk, Ivo Markovic, uh, who uh, 
gathered people from different religious communities after the war. Immediately after the Dayton Agreement was signed, he gathered people from uh, uh, the local uh, uh, Muslim, uh, Orthodox, Catholic, and Jewish community, and, and Protestant community as well, and, and ask them, uh, 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 encourage them to, uh, to build a multi-religious choir. Uh, we interviewed uh, Ivo Markovic, but also uh, participants in the choir, and it was a very interesting because people uh, shared with us uh, how in the beginning, uh, how difficult it was uh, for them in the beginning to, uh, to attend this choir, to participate in this choir, because uh, people from their uh, respective communities were uh, very cautious and, and, and somehow even suspicious of this activity. They said, how can you uh, sing the songs of our enemies? But then slowly, uh, step by step, uh, people came to appreciate uh, each other's songs and, 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 and sing them. And, and as one of our uh, interview, uh, interviews shared with us, there uh, a specific theology developed out of this uh, singing together. Uh, the choir consequently became uh, very famous. Um, it got several um, peace prizes uh, in different, uh, and it uh, performs everywhere in the world. So. I think that arts uh, is of, are often under, um, underappreciated, uh, underappreciated um, methodology of peace building. And uh, I, as one of my policy recommendations, because uh, um, uh, Professor Caruso uh, would like also us to present some policy recommendations, would be for policymakers to look at the role of uh, arts, uh, not only uh, music, but also uh, other kinds of arts, theatre and um, so on, uh, how they can bring people together and uh, uh, start uh, uh, processes of reconciliation. Um, however, uh, these were the positive uh, achievements, but uh, there have been uh, many challenges, um, as we discovered during our research. Uh, one of the major challenges was the role of international organizations. While recognizing that international organizations were key for uh, financing and, and encouraging interreligious dialogue on, on the ground, uh, many uh, of those organizations uh, we found came to the region with uh, very um, superficial understanding of the realities uh, on the ground. And they often promoted a very uh, naive multiculturalist approaches as though interreligious dialogue is uh, uh, some model that can be just uh, uh, in, uh, applied to different places without context, uh, uh, looking at the context and the historical uh, situation. Uh, in this way, uh, uh, our recommendation to international organizations uh, uh, would have been that they should uh, contextualize their efforts and, and, and their uh, intervention uh, in the field uh, uh, of, of interest dialogue on the ground uh, and, and uh, be aware of uh, the differences and, and the historical processes that uh, have been implied in, in, in how the situation looks uh, nowadays. Um, additionally, uh, very often international uh, actors and organizations um, uh, forced local, uh, local uh, communities to reconcile before the communities were ready to reconcile. For example, uh, a very prominent example uh, in, uh, in Bosnia when uh, 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 there was an insistence on the part of the uh, international community that the rebuilding of the uh, famous uh, uh, Ottoman uh, time uh, mosque in uh, Banja Luka, which was destroyed uh, by the uh, by the Serb paramilitaries uh, should uh, be rebuilt immediately after the end of the war. Uh, and, and this led to uh, protests by the local uh, com Serbian communities and even to one death. So basically, uh, uh, this is another policy recommendation. You can't force people to reconcile before they are ready to reconcile, before they have gone through cert certain uh, processes and stages uh, which uh, uh, can support uh, processes of reconciliation. Um, 
Um, another achievement, uh, oh, sorry, another uh, challenge uh, which we discovered was uh, uh, also um, uh, a specific understanding of interreligious dialogue as a discussion or talk between um, uh, hierarchs from different communities without necessarily inclusion of uh, uh, laity and uh, and uh, women, uh, so access to interreligious dialogue was uh, shaped by power uh, power relations and, and structures which uh, need to be uh, reconsidered. Um, I would suggest that uh, a, a few things uh, about uh, how interreligious dialogue uh, is uh, uh, is defined. In addition uh, to what we emphasize in the book, that interreligious dialogue should not be just about talking about difference and re uh, reconciling uh, and finding similarities, but it should be also a common action, meaning that uh, religious uh, or people from different religious communities should be uh, participating in, in social activities that bring those communities closer together uh, and, and should be discussing and also taking um, uh, taking some uh, uh, stance towards uh, important issues of the day, uh, economic uh, and also political uh, political grievances uh, that should be addressed. Uh, so interreligious dialogue should be reformulated not just as religious activities but as a social activity. This is an activity that uh, also includes a discussion of uh, economic and political grievances. Uh, also, I would recommend that interreligious dialogue uh, uh, should not be used uh, um, as it often is, uh, as uh, explicitly as uh, um, instrument of governmentality of uh, different religious communities, uh, and uh, which uh, securitize these communities and try to uh, to rule and uh, and some, somehow categorize different uh, different religions uh, without addressing uh, core and inequalities. Core horizontal inequalities and also vertical inequalities within these uh, religious traditions. Uh, uh, so contrary to um, some expectations that interreligious dialogue should be like a cultural activity, uh, I would argue that uh, uh, interreligious dialogue should address uh, economic and political uh, differences and should avoid culturalizing uh, inequalities and, and realities that are political, so it, it should take stance, uh, uh, political stance. Um, in uh, peace science recently, we have uh, some research on the role of women in, uh, in um, peace dialogues around the world, and uh, we know that it's very tiny compared to that's, that's, uh, that's uh, embarrassing if considering the role that women have in the society. Uh, perhaps in religious dialogues, even smaller. So I think she, uh, she, 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 she had a very good point in stressing, in stressing this. So it's time for, uh, for questions. So if uh, we have questions. Question, but... Uh, I'd like to raise two uh, points very briefly. First, Professor Atakan has spoken about uh, religious pluralism. Very interesting. Yeah. However, uh, pluralism does not, uh, does not automatically mean tolerance. Eh? In fact, uh, Jonathan Sachs, the chief rabbi of the uh, British Empire, in his very interesting book, Persistence of Faith, speaks about the irony of pluralism. And he says, from pluralism, one would expect a spirit of more tolerance. But he points to the, as an example, to the Balkans, yeah, where uh, after the fall of communism, there have been so many conflicts and new forms of uh, racism and... Uh, and uh, well, uh, anti-Jewish sentiments have been, uh, have cropped up after the fall of communism. 
And the second point, uh, Professor Ina spoke about interreligious uh, coexistence. Yeah, here, we, in fact, in Albania, we boast of uh, interreligious peaceful coexistence. I don't like the word tolerance, which has negative connotations. I would rather use the word harmony. However, we must pay great attention. We must not take it for granted because uh, this is a very fragile issue. Religion, I said before, eh, it can change hearts. However, it can easily be manipulated for political reasons or uh, for, uh, other, uh, as, uh, to express certain prejudices, hatred. For example, uh, Islamic fundamentalists are not so much their attitude is not so much out of love for God, but rather, I think, out of hatred or prejudice towards uh, Western society, for example. And uh, so I would recommend, uh, you mentioned uh, education, education for peace, which must be uh, from our part as religions, but also from the part of the uh, education system. Secondly, to, we must pay special attention, we leaders of uh, religions, special attention against any form of uh, proselytism, which is uh, very dangerous. And another point, also on the part of the state, in uh, the constitutions of the uh, Republic of Albania, it is stated in Article 10, that the state accepts, uh, respects all religions on an equal basis. And uh, this must also be uh, taken seriously into consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you for this conference. Just two words that I would like to put in the debate that I find absolutely necessary. I think that religions, Islam, Christianity, Catholicism, Orthodoxy, may contribute a lot for peace, stressing two main values that I think they share, and that may be the two lungs of, uh, like uh, an inspiration for glo globalization. And those two values, I think, are human dignity, and human brotherhood. And in this sense, I think that really religions may be, at the country of the past, really a strong um, motors for peace, focusing on those two issues, human dignity, transcendent sacred dignity, and universal human brotherhood. Uh, simple, straightforward uh, question. Do you think there should be any um, um, official religions out there? Might sound a bit... Uh, the, the, should, should there be official religions? Should there be no country with official religions? And basically, official religion kind of sounds like a state religion. A religion that is recognized by the state or that should the state not recognize any religions at all and let the people deal with it, whatever they want to believe. Thanks. It's clear. So we can, uh, we can have a round of comments on what we hear. Uh, who wanna, would like to... Your, question, your point was for... Uh, uh, English, English, language and literature, better university. Sorry. Your friend, you, you, your, uh, your point was addressed to Professor Atakan? Yeah. Both. Yeah, it's, it's, it's why. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, Okay. Uh, uh, the Catholic school of religion, Scott Appleby, famously, um, uh, famously defined religion as an ambiguous phenomenon. 
ambiguous uh, in the sense that it can uh, have both positive and negative effects, that it can bring to better coexistence, understanding, uh, uh, shared values, but it can also instigate differences, uh, harden and, and deepen boundaries between communities, and uh, become involved also in nationalist and other political projects. So what people do with religion is uh, uh, whether people are tolerant, uh, so they do different things, they can do different things with religion. We, uh, of course, uh, universalistic values in religions are very important, but uh, very often realities uh, on the ground uh, are completely different. Uh, regarding this uh, point, um, uh, Monsignor made about uh, tolerance and, and uh, uh, coexistence and pluralism. I completely agree. Uh, in, in the sociological uh, and philosophical literature, there is a clear difference between uh, so-called negative and positive tolerance. When negative tolerance is seen like you tolerate the other because you can't get rid of him or her, and you just uh, share a, a, a common uh, space without really engaging the other uh, in a sincere uh, way, while positive tolerance is uh, much more than just tolerating the other, but also engaging uh, the other, uh, somehow building shared uh, spaces and shared public uh, spheres with, with the other. So this is a very important distinction. Uh, and uh, tolerance uh, can, uh, can be also manipulated and, and also uh, as uh, Wendy Brown uh, has uh, uh, warned us, uh, it can become a mechanism of neoliberal governmentality that is uh, uh, a way of uh, somehow manage, managing religion and religious difference, which is not necessarily uh, in, uh, in the course of a better interreligious uh, understanding. Uh, I think, yeah. Religious pluralism. So I talked about this concept. Actually, it's not an ideal or an attainment target for me. But these are concepts emerging in the course of history. And I try to reflect that this kind of ideas existed in the past with different practices. And um, for example, core Islamic values, respect for the rule of law, freedom of belief, justice, prevention of majorities' tyranny and oppression over minorities or prevention of uh, minorities' tyranny or oppression over majorities. So these are the ideals we are trying to uh, attain, reach. But these are concepts, and I think we should utilize these concepts. And as you've seen, there are, I, at, the, at the beginning of my speech, I said um, it's difficult to define these concepts in a way which is acceptable to everyone. But there is something we can contribute. And if we do that to, together, hopefully we will do something uh, for the time in which we live together to uh, live peacefully. Official religion, Religion is something that cultivates in the heart. So no official religion or state religion, it stays here. You know, once Prophet was talking to his companions, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, piety, righteousness is here. He tapped three times to, the, to his heart. It's here, it's here, it's here. It's not out there. It's not something external, it's internal. So... These are my thoughts. Do you want to add something at this point, Eduardo Sojo? Yeah, yeah. Actually, about religious tolerance, many people uh, think that religious tolerance means also religious freedom, but it's totally something different. When we're talking about religious uh, tolerance, means that there is, a, a, let's say, a state religion, a majority, that, let's say, tolerate and accept the others doesn't mean, though, that we have religious freedom. We need, that's why we said about Declaration of Human Rights, every modern state should accept 
and accept the religious freedom because now the situation has changed. We, have, we live in a multicultural society. We have additions from all over the world. So sometimes there is the need, let's say, not to have state religions or to uh, redefine this uh, concept in order to accept the others and work with the others. Because sometimes the term religious, politically, the term religious tolerance means that we have a majority and we tolerate you. We leave you. But that doesn't mean, as professor said, that we have a positive reconnection. And also about uh, policies. Let's say when we have a multicultural society and we need to create new policies to find solution about uh, uh, the collaboration of religious communities, uh, usually uh, some uh, researches have shown that uh, if there is, uh, let's say, a politician that comes from a specific, let's say, religious community, then the policy that they are going to work on will be accepted. It is a funny thing in the United States uh, it was public uh, research that showed that if President Obama, if President Obama uh, had the same religious, uh, same religion, or uh, uh, was part of, uh, let's say, the Evangelicals or Lutherans, they said that if he was in the same, let's say, denomination, then we would accept his policies about religion, and we wouldn't accept the white Republican. It's a funny thing, but if, let's say, you have the same religion or you belong in the same religious community with your representative, then it's mo mostly likely to be accepted, the policies that they are going to create. So if there is, a, let's say, a united policy, a model from politicians that belong to different religious communities, a, a strong collaboration, maybe this policy would be accepted and it would be easier to be adopted in the modern world, in the modern sites. That's my opinion. Thank you very much. Then I think it's, uh, it's time to go. Before uh, we go, I thank everybody for uh, your attention. Thank you for everybody for coming here. Uh, I would like only to stress two things. First of all, CHESPIC is the Central, European Center of uh, Peace, Science, Integration, Cooperation. We organize this every year. Every year, summer school on peace, science, you can find information over there on the table. And you can also check on the website uh, the activities we do. Uh, secondly, let me thank the people who helped to organize this meeting. Uh, our director, Evis Carandrea, and uh, the staff for the marketing, Elma and uh, Marcella. I am heavily in debt with them. And uh, last time, last but not least, of course, thank to our speakers. Someone travel a lot, someone travel less, someone is from Tirana, but in any case, the committee to be here is something which is valuable in itself. Thank you. If you want to know uh, news about other activities by Chespi, you can also ask to be in our uh, uh, mailing list. Uh, we spread every two weeks. Uh, a newsletter about uh, about Balkans, about international relations, about uh, everything which is connected to peace, conflict, and uh, related topics. So, if you're interested, send an email to chespeak at unizetakpm.al uh, uh, and see you next time. Thanks a lot.